With all of the things going on today, I mean, we talked about a lot of things. I'm sure a lot of you have various questions. Um, anyone? They want to drink. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are prizes. Come on. Yeah. Or we can go into a moderation, but I try to avoid that for now. Uh, I'm going to pick someone. <laughs> <laughs> People I know. Daniel. <laughs> Any questions? Um, basically, it's for uh, PY. Thank you. Because I was a bit uh, interested in your NFC presentation. What happens when, it's a very basic question, so, so don't laugh. What happens when a customer changes his phone? Uh, there is already a whole set of user scenario and specification that has been defined by the industry to handle all the various situations when the customer change phone. So when the customer change phone, the customer has two possibilities. They will either contact directly to the telco, and then from the telco customer service, they will send the message down to the TSM, Trusted Service Manager. And then the Trusted Service Manager will then subsequently send the message to the bank to, to, and to inform them that the change. I think the, the, the key tricky point that is not really in, that need to be modified is actually we need to modify the TNC with your customer. Because during that period of time, if there's any fraudulent transaction, who is going to take care? So, so there is a TNC part that has to, to be taken care of. And this part is never in any of the specification. It is always in the, the user operation uh, situation that, that has to take care of. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, everyone's pretty shy, I guess. Eh? Uh, no, no, no. Okay, my question is for Melanie. Since you've seen a different market, uh, maybe Australia for an example, what's the difference you see in the mindsets of financial clients there versus in Singapore? Um, well, look, oh, I think I've got a mic. Um, look, I think that there are, you know, there are some banks in Australia that are really progressive. And there are other banks that are really conservative. And I think, you know, it was kind of on Pierre's presentation about, well, I don't really want to be the pioneer. I just want to be the leader. And, I, well, and I think in, in Australia, most of the time, I just don't want to get left behind um, rather than, you know, not, rather than trying to be a leader. I mean, the case study that I will pull out um, from Australia is probably the Commonwealth Bank. I think having worked at Google for five years, when I joined, they were almost a completely different organisation. And it's literally one or two people, one or two agitators who kind of, um, you know, take that view that if where we go as an organisation and our strategic direction does not align with where the future consumer is, that's a strategic risk. And so we're better off trying some things to combat that and failing than not doing anything about it at all. There's actually a bigger risk that we just get completely left behind. And so one or two people in an organisation can change that. And then, you know, there's kind of a domino effect <laughs> after that, because once they do it, then others feel comfortable in copying and all that kind of stuff. Um, but look, I think, I think probably the biggest difference is that um, there's a view that the fundamental consumer behaviour is different. And it's not, because at the end of the day, humans are humans are humans. And they all, you know, need to pay for stuff, and they all need to talk to people. And so I think there's probably a misconception that regions are really different, and you know, no, products are really different, right? But consumers are actually the same. <laughs> so yeah, I think you'll start to see that will level out once more phones are in the market and people are doing some of the same things on phones. Great. Anyone else? Because if not. Looks like two moves are going to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now the ball's rolling. Sorry, just um, I'm Sharon. I just wanted to share. Uh, as a consumer, I would really like to have do transaction online, transaction on my mobile phone. But well, I do really think Singaporeans are really ready for it because security is one big area where I can do searching for information and doing all the research stuff online and even go into my my bank, e-banking, but I will never really do a real transaction because of uh, hacking and security. So I'm not sure. I mean, to me, in the next five years, I think Singaporeans are people like me, not ready. 
this is one of my biggest frustrations, but it's also I mean, a big amount of income that away from me. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is, look at the, pay, the, the, the financial instruments in your life today. They are cash and cards. They have a far higher risk of loss as you as a consumer than a mobile payments device, and I'll tell you why. EMV as a standard, which is now you know, pretty much a standard right across this, with this region, which is a chip and pin, which is all of your cards today. Okay? That's based on a, a scheme which essentially, essentially manages a few risks that makes sure I've had around fraud and so forth. Okay. What mobile does above and beyond that is it adds factors yet that the banks are not yet using it. I blame the banks for this. Because mobile payments allows two other factors to be validated, which they don't do now. They can validate the location of that payment instrument because the network can tell them exactly where it is. And that payment instrument is also interactive, so that means you can have a two-way conversation with the consumer at the point they're actually doing the transaction. So my challenge here is there's this misconception, and the, unfortunately it's the big uh, risk houses like Verisign and, and so forth that say that you know, for mobile phones are scary and so forth for payments. But the reality is the technology that's in a mobile phone is far superior than any other, any other payment instrument you have today. And what we have is we have a gap and this is what I do live and breathe on this every day, is educating consumers that your phone is actually a more secure payment instrument. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Do you think that PCI standards are actually adequately prepared for that transformation? Because there's going to be a massive shift in liability once the standards are actually fine for mobile transactions in the way that they can actually take place and they're not right now. So that everyone knows what PCI is in this room. So it's basically a, a series of controls to manage the open transfer the open transport of your credit card data. Uh, it was you know built for around make control make stripes and so forth. It has this whole series of controls around what has to happen in the procure that product. Um, the reality is most of the things around card emulation is PCI is almost not relevant. Main reason being because you have a thing called tokenization. So the actual card number is never in the network. So if you look at, for instance, who, who uses the iTunes store or the, you know, their app store and so forth on your mobile phone? The reality is, is that credit card number is not in your phone. In fact, it's not even on iTunes store, the store service. They tokenize that with an offset, which is a one-way algorithmic number, which means your card data is never in the clear. So it can't be stolen. So that, that technology is bridging the gap around PCI, and that I see is going to be a huge play in the idea of around uh, PCI ready uh, mobile payments. I think the question may be applicable to everybody. So um, we spoke about customer adoption, we spoke about technology, and we spoke about the differences and great things that banks can do to digitize uh, the financial industry. And the one key word that it's quite prominent in Singapore, this regulation. Um, you know, the, the more digital and the more innovation that you come up with, the more regulators um, will come down with more regulations and things that we need to abide to. For example, the upcoming transactions and things like that. So, at what point in time is on your experiences in other countries and also your knowledge of Singapore, um, at what point in time will we actually merge to have a balance between this innovation versus what regulators actually think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one's in the Everyone else has corporate policy, so I can go against this. Because Tony and I have a love hate relationship. There's no Tony Chu heads up MAS's regulation around technology. Um, if they do, they continue in the pathway they are. MAS will actually put Singapore behind the rest of the world. And I'll take one example they're doing right now. Is if they mandate separate tokens for mobile banking, they will put Singapore behind. Um, so I think what will happen is it will become a tipping point where MAS will have to wake up and realise that Malaysia's got a good framework, the Philippines got a good framework, they've got a good in Hong Kong as well. Why are we doing the same? Unfortunately, we still have a very conservative banking, banking regulation here, which is driven by the four local banks. And it actually comes, I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to be very bold here. It comes out of, they haven't yet to learn embrace new technology, so they wait for MAS to tell them what to do. So MAS has to do prescriptive regulation. The same as happening in cloud computing right now as well, is that they've just drafted a whole lot of regulation around cloud computing and banking. Mm. And, and it says, you know, that you, no bank in Singapore will go cloud computing unless you follow these 25 rules. 
when I go when I said, well, hang, I said, hang on, you actually realise that every international bank in this country already does cloud computing because their core banking and processing is not in Singapore. So technically, that's in a private cloud in another country. And then the MS is like, oh, hang on, you're right. <laughs> so I think there's 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 a, there's a curve we have to get over, and it's around how to get a culture of innovation around stepping forward within the banks here in Singapore. Now, I, I've been here for five years, so I've dealt with all of the major banks in some degree. Uh, it's, we need to change the culture. I mean, I can just quickly talk about the Australian experience because probably 15, nearly 20 years ago, there was a whole raft of regulations that have come up and, and I guess tranches of regulation have come on top of that and top of that. And while some will say, you know, that regulation protected us quite a lot <laughs> from things like the GFC, there's you know, we're having similar debates um, at the moment. We actually already have regulations in place that say you can't store customer data um, outside of Australia, which limits the bank's abilities to use things like the cloud and, and makes people scared about um, mobile. I think uh, what we're starting to see now, which is in my opinion the only way things are going to change, is if the banks actually get together and start to figure out what self-regulation looks like and take that to the regulatory authorities and say, look, we know what's going on in this space. These are the things we think actually keep <coughs> consumers safe, keep the system safe and all that sort of stuff and go, with, go to them with the first draft. Because I think as Scott was saying, prescriptive style is never where you really want to go. <laughs> You'd much prefer to give them something that they edit than and come back to. And that's what we're starting to see in Australia around the cloud and the banking stuff. Um, and it's slowly, you know, they, their regulators are actually starting to appreciate the education because there's no way they can keep up with every single new technology that's coming out at the pace that they're coming out. There's an opportunity for Google now. No comment. Uh, well, uh, I am a Singaporean and I haven't had the opportunity to interact with NES and some of the, uh, the banks too. I think the, uh, from, from my experience is that because of the, uh, the advancement of technology and because of the change of all those new technology that is added into, into the system that need to be tailored to the current process. I think there is no such people usually, not many that I have encountered in the local banks or in MAS that are able to converge the two and then put up the right explanation to, to the authority to let them understand where are the risks. I think in whatever technology, there's always a risk. Mm -hmm. But the question is, we have to identify the risk and how to mitigate the risk and how to put this match with the current existing process. And I don't think there's such a type of level of people in the industry today that's able to go up and talk in front of the Hi, I'm Audrey from Plain Mula. And um, so I understand there's a lot of concerns around regulation. And it seems to me that the average consumer who would be using a mobile phone would essentially be the digital natives who will grow up to be using technology so rapidly. And these are kind of the teens and the young people that we see today that, you know, the kind of experience they have to the mobile phone is going to be radically different from us as individuals just because we are living in such a different age. And so I'm really curious how you would describe how a financial institution would be selling to these new age of consumers who would be, you know, kind of the 20s and who would be in their 20s and 30s, you know, 10 years from now. How radically different would they have to change their strategies around that? Absolutely, 100% radical change. Yeah, I mean, I just think that if you, if you think that the only way to form a relationship with the, the generation that are coming through is face to face, you're going to get left behind. I think if you don't have a strategy for engaging people all the way through the journey via a mobile device, you're going to get left behind. And I think that if you're not um, innovating your products to the point where there actually isn't a, a product anymore. It's like, what are the combinations of benefit? I mean, the other day I was speaking to an insurance client and they said, you know, maybe in the future it's not the car that you'll insure, it's getting from A to B, right? Now that's, that's a, like a completely different paradigm and it's a little bit crazy and out there. But they're the kind of things you have to think about, right? What's going to be important to people in the future in a virtual world? Um, maybe a car's not going to be that valuable to people anymore whatever it might be. But if you're not sort of thinking about those things now, I guarantee it, your competitors will be and your successor will be. <laughs> uh, 
I personally think that to I mean, address the needs of the younger generation, we will start with uh, transactions and payments. And that's where the change will come from. Um, I think uh, you, um, and you already see that in many players like Simple or Moven Bank. I think Scott can talk about it. But uh, providing um, a, an aggregated view on all your payments and a much more convenient way to, to pay uh, through NFC or, or through coupons. That's uh, how the, how you uh, win the young younger generation. They don't care to go to a branch. They don't care to go uh, to talk to an RM. What they care about is the convenience to the banking, and uh, it will go come through. It will start from the transaction. I think mm -hmm. that's what I believe. I just gonna say to explain what he means by moving banks. So I actually am starting a bank, and we've gone a hundred percent radical. Is that so we realize that signing up for a bank for a digital native has to be as simple as starting a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've literally done that. You sign up for a bank account using your Facebook credentials. We take your name, address in and so forth, and that becomes the form collection. We then verify that in the same traditional ways that banks do at the back end, but we actually do all the KYC collection through, fa through, fa through Facebook credentials. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say what Scott was, keywords radical. And I hear a lot of times we work together here in Singapore, I won't spend too much time because we already talk. But I think social mobility is one of the key components. But the other thing is big data, right? Are we really leveraging big data and really using it in a way where it's going to help us make better decisions to connect with the consumers, right? Adding in that social component. Um, legacy, does banks have the platforms to actually move into this space? And they're starting to, um, but they're really large organizations that may not be able to right now move very quickly. So there is a lot of things, but I think the question is if you're you know, thinking about how do you market to these younger generations, um, they're already telling us today. Mm, right? Right. So you have to listen. That's right. Yeah. And I think that you know, the example that I referenced before around the Commonwealth Bank, I mean, I think they've really honed in on this insight that if you get them between 16 and 18, you've got them for life. And so all of the innovations, I'm sure if you're 60 or 70, you look at what the Commonwealth Bank's doing and going, what the hell? But they've just launched um, this product called Kaching, which you should go have a look at. It's K-A-C-H-I-N-G. Mobile payment, um, and you, pay, you can pay people through Facebook. So it's completely disintermediating, disintermediating other banks, and it's making that connection happen through Facebook. Because that's where they realise the little change and the stuff happens. And if you're 17, and you've got a Commonwealth Bank account, right now you go, that's cool. I really dig that. And no other bank lets me do that, so why would I leave? So, you know, I just think it's it's so simple and tactical, but it's part of a much smarter strategy about how do I actually form those connections now. And I think it's actually important to recognise Commonwealth Bank's history of innovation. Uh, Commonwealth Bank realised back in the 1980s that getting the customer as early as possible was critical yeah. to a long life relationship. So what did they do? They went to every primary school in Australia and gave them money boxes for every kid. Dolomites. Dolomite accounts. And they came back once a week to all those primary schools and took savings deposits from the age of 5 to 18. That meant these customers were going to be Commonwealth Bank customers for life and they have 45% higher save, better savings habits than anyone else in the market because they've done regular savings for like 15 years of their life. Mm. I just want to say, and I love what um, Mel said this morning and, and what you're saying is, guys, it's about financial education early on, right? We talked a lot about the stop looking at the last touch conversion. Um, look at the zero moment of truth, the top of the funnel, and leverage the educational components of digital to help win that journey for you know generation of 20, 30, so 12, Fred 30, Greg. right? Was that Timmy, right? Yeah. Um, so you gotta, it's a rethink, um, but I think the tools are out there today. Mm. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? We have time for a couple more questions. Um, this question is probably uh, more for uh, Pierre. Um, in your, um, I mean, you've obviously been um, looking at many banks, and obviously the, I think the application of digital is more in the retail space. So if you told me, okay, I mean, you need to focus your digital efforts, where have you seen most throughput? Acquisition, engagement, retention. So, I mean, I probably can't be 100% digital on all fronts, but where have you seen in your sort of use cases the most impact that digital has brought to these uh, banking clients? Um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a tough question, but um, um, 
I think um, I've uh, seen it in terms of uh, the, w the most impact, I would say, is two front. Um, one, um, we've seen players for cross-selling. So uh, pushing on the multi-channel, we've seen actually uh, when they've been able to convert users to, heavy to being heavy uh, digital users, we've seen an uptick in cross-sell for, for this consumer. So that's a clear thing. Uh, one very good example is uh, what banking there, for example, uh, I gave before. The work that banking there has done in, um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Spain, where it's fully integrated, and they've seen a, a very uh, big uptick. The second uh, impact uh, is obviously cost. Uh, you've seen especially the Nordics. They've been very aggressively pushing transactions online, and in parallel, have reduced their branch footprint. So that's been a direct impact on, uh, on cost, which you, you didn't mention uh, before. Um, okay, in the interest of time, we have, we, have, we have one more question. You raise your hand first, so, and then we'll do a drinks later, so we can have more discussions. Please. Okay. Um, this question is, is about um, perhaps you can share some success stories to how you know, maybe in your encounters with the government bodies, how you could have successfully changed on the culture in which they they deploy technology. In the place of Singapore, I would have thought that um, applying passport online would be as you know easy. I received a notification recently, and I. So, so applications, it takes you three minutes to fill the form, or alternatively, you can go to www, whatever, whatever. So, I'm an internet guy, so I'll go and do the internet thing. I think it cost me about a good 45 minutes, you know, a lot of frustration, when you sweat. Uh, so I said, bugger that, I'll just fill up, spend three minutes, you know, find a little folder and just start on it and put it in the mail. And I think you should, I'm expecting a passport probably this week, or you know, perhaps maybe sometime this week or next week. So the, the whole point is that much as we all talk about technology and adoption of mobile phones and blah, 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 there are some very basic product and services. A passport is a need, it's not, it's, it's a, it's not, it's a need, it's not a want. Right? Banking services, some very basic banking services are a need, not a want. But yet, the government bodies somehow seem to interfere, seem to get in the way for something that are uh, such basic essential as, as such. So perhaps anyone of you can share some success stories of how have you converted, whether it's in Australia or in other parts of the world, convert, uh, converting some of these governing bodies who are instrumental to drive technology to a larger, and to a greater height. Not just about whether businesses want to take it to a greater height. Um, yes, please. Well, I mean, I think the, it's probably only in the last five years, or definitely since this last government in Australia, that there's been a really clear signal from the government that the digital economy is actually going to be the future. And so there's been huge investments in infrastructure, national broadband network, um, trying to get Australia up to speed. And I guess the government's now actually out there and pushing the fact that this is a way for Australia to flourish when we don't have the scale that China can provide in manufacturing and that we have you know, a mining resource that is you know, kind of not very sustainable and all that sort of stuff. So it's a great way for us to grow as a country and as, a, as an economy. That's the federal government big view. <laughs> State government, I mean, I think this is, and this is a totally personal view, not a Google view at all. Um, you know, there's a lot of entrenched um, processes and ways that people make money in, light, in state, state and local governments that technology can actually, um, technology makes it hard to justify <laughs> charging all these fees. Right. So, I mean, the best example is something like stamp duty in Australia. When you buy a house, 3% of the price of the house goes to the government. Now, it's, it's crazy. There is literally, there's not even a person who sits there and hands a piece of paper to someone. It's just a bank. Now, if all that was done electronically, it's kind of hard to say, oh, and by the way, <laughs> let's, you know, give me 3% of the value of your house. So, there's just, I mean, and look, I'll be bold as well. You guys are in the same boat. You guys think that people don't want to do this stuff. They do, but you haven't built a way for them to do it, so they don't. And it's the same with government. If they built ways for people to do it, they would do it. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just about taking that first step and, and that shift between this is not a risk. It's a risk if I don't do it. It's a risk that, you know, I'm going to be left behind. To play on success, and I'm going to play the theme of finance, is it Two, two government successes which I see right now, uh, which I put it on a pedestal as the be benchmark, is the Maldives and the, the Canadian Mints. Is they've actually been forced, had enough, enough foresight to realise, and Maldives did this first, is they realised that the amount of money they spend producing cash, mm -hmm. remember they produce cash off tax dollars, 
So, the so you know, you guys have to pay your tax dollars here in Singapore. They give that to a, to a body to actually produce the plastic piece of paper that comes back into your pocket. What the Maldives government realised is that it would actually be more cost effective by over 85% to stop issuing physical cash. Everything's electronic, but give universal access to everyone. So in the, in, in the Maldives, the Maldives Monetary Authority, uh, abbreviated to Montran, has done a project with ADP, which is the extension of developer partners, to actually physically, uh, sorry, completely remove the physical issuance of cash in the Maldives by 2017. And that's on track to do that. It'll be a ubiquitous uh, monetary system that everyone will have access to, no matter what telco or bank you're with. That means that all currency will be digital. The wow. Canadian Mint announced a very similar project about, about a month ago, uh, where again, they'll redirect, they'll redirect tax dollars to, change, to move away from cash insurance to only digital, only digital currency. Now, in Singapore, that should, should be really easy to do. Mm. A small, controlled, confined space. So it's the governments that do that, that's a huge success, as I say. Wow. I also think digital identity is a huge, is a huge opportunity, which I, you know, I'm going to be very bold here. You know, I think Facebook will own digital identity within, within five years. Um, it's, it's a real thing. thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just I mean, it's really around, you, you think about identity, identity at digital level, is what do you have to do? You have to collect some information and verify it. Facebook has collected the information of 900 million people. All we have to do is verify it, and that becomes the best source of KYC in the world. By a long, long way. I mean, that's what we've already doing. Is Facebook already collects it? We're just going to verify it. 